Hey guys, welcome to Chief Pigskin's YouTube channel. You're about to watch a home clinic where we find one quality coach and he talks on one very specific subject. If you'd like to see more of these come your way, please like and subscribe below and check us out at clinic.chiefpigskin.com. Hey guys, welcome to another home clinic for Chief Pigskin. I am Anthony Gonzalez, the head football coach at Everett Alvarez High School. Um, before we get started for today's clinic, I want to give a quick shout out to um, Coach Nate Jones over at Impact Marketing Specialties. He's given 30% off for all coaches right now. I uh, want to introduce to you Mason Hughes. He is the head coach at Central Valley Christian High School in Visalia, California. He's going on his 12th season as the head coach there, and um, he's doing some big things with his team. He's gone to the last two or three section finals. Is that correct? Yeah, three. Three, and then and in 2018, you guys were California State runners-up. Um, today is a little different for me because I'm usually talking about some type of wing T or double wing, um, um, single wing thing, but I get to talk about defense. And uh, Coach Mason here is going to talk about defensive game planning for us today. Um, it's exciting for me because um, that's where I got my shot when um, I got um, first into coaching. Um, my second season – uh, I was named the defensive coordinator, so I get to like listen to other guys talk about it, and it's more fun for me because like I love the wing T, but like defense is where I came from. So I'm super excited to hear about how you guys plan for um, your game planning today, Coach. I was looking over your guys' stats, right? And the last two seasons, you guys have have had over um, 130 tackles for a loss, and um, over 40 sacks, and it looks like sorry, I'm looking at my notes about 40 turnovers in the past two seasons. Like, is the game planning what really gets you guys all these great numbers or is it a combination with the kids? Like, how do you how do you attribute all these good numbers for your team? Yeah, I mean, players, right? I mean, obviously the players make a difference. Um, but I, I do think we, we emphasize um, some things uh, in how we game plan that allow us to scheme up uh, different blitzes, um, allow us to play players a certain way um, that put us in position to create turn turnovers. You know, I don't, we don't spend a lot of time teaching turnover circuits. Um, we believe that the best way to get a turnover is the element of surprise, you know? And so when the, uh, when the offense doesn't know the defense is going to be where they're going to be, you know, we always tell the kids um, we need to be in the right place at the offense's wrong time. And so you know, there, there's something to that. So I, I do think that's, that's something that we definitely have, have instilled in our kids. But, you know, I mean, when you've got a kid who's just better than the kid he's going against, sometimes the ball pops out. <laughs> Always helpful, yeah. So when you're ready, go ahead and uh, share your screen and um, take it away. All right. All right, well, thanks. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak and to share some knowledge um, on what maybe I've learned over the last um, – 20 years of coaching, um, 12 being a head coach, um, about seven of that being the defensive coordinator slash head coach. And so um, all this stuff that uh, I'm going to speak about today is, is applicable uh, to defense, of course, but I think you, there's a lot of things that, that somebody could apply to, to just organization as well. So my contact num stuff information is there, and um, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, just, I just want to breeze through pretty quickly um, our philosophy on some things. And so um, we, uh, we firmly believe in being efficient. Um, we believe time management is super important. And so um, one thing that you'll see in all of our game planning and, and things like that is, is it's very technology driven. Um, we don't meet as a staff a whole lot in face to face, but we do have a three hour meeting on Sundays um, and, and our coaches are on campus 15 hours a week uh, if you count the practices and the games. And so 18 hours is what our coaches are there. And I, I feel like, you know, I tell a lot of my coaches, um, especially the guys um, who are not, who are off campus coaches, we have three on campus coaches and nine off campus coaches. And I tell all of them that coaching football has become their hobby. And so they need to make sure, you know, to keep their uh, relationships with their families and the proper perspective to understand that they may have just lost, you know, 18 hours a week of hobby time of whatever they've done. And so a lot of my guys are into fitness and stuff. And although that's important, I try to emphasize to them that, 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 that 
this should not come in front of their family. And so if, if football is going to cause a divide in the family, they need to stop coaching. And so um, we, I'm really serious about that. And so we really want to make sure we're as efficient as possible. So this whole coronavirus has allowed us to think outside the box even more and, and open up for Zoom meetings and different things like that. Um, we, when, we, when we install with our kids, uh, we use Google, Google Team Drive and, and Huddle to be super efficient. Um, we have a, a Google Sheet that we use um, that shows how um, our, that, that allows our coaches to meet uh, digitally. And we get a lot of the stuff that most meetings um, take probably an hour to go through. And that stuff's all done because it's, it's on the Google Sheet meeting um, prep sheet. And, uh, and then we install everything in the spring. Um, you know, we've been doing online spring install for years. And so this uh, pandemic has not really put us back in that regard at all. We're right on time. In fact, I'd say we're probably ahead of where we usually are as far as the mental preparation. And so we want to use technology technology as best we can. Um, and what we do with that and real, uh, briefly, I'll just tell you, we have a defensive, uh, video that we, um, give out to the kids on Thursdays, they take a quiz. And then on Fridays we meet through Google meet, um, and go over the most often missed questions and answer any questions. We, our offense does that on Tuesdays and same thing meets on Fridays and we have our meetings that way. And we've done that for years. Uh, our meetings used to be in person, but now they're on Google meet, but the the online quizzes and stuff has been happening for years and uh, just really, really helpful. I think the kids really like it. But we, we basically say if we're resource is going to save time and enhance learning, we're going to look into it and do it. Um, and then um, I think we've developed this idea that teaching can occur in the classroom using film um, instead of always just having to do walkthroughs and things like that out on the practice field. And that way our practice time is used for reps. And so as coaches, I want our coaches to be as prepared as possible, but they also need to use their time efficiently. So that word efficiency is going to show up a lot. Um, just in practice week in general, a couple things. Um, we we um, identify different tempos. And so we tell our kids, uh, obviously, if we're in the classroom, that's teaching tempo, which just to us means they'll be standing around listening from coaches, coaches talking, players listening. Um, and then there'll be other tempos out on the field. And we, we make sure they know what the tempo is. And so um, the only time that they shouldn't be moving at full speed is, is when we're in a teaching tempo. And so we make sure to tell our kids about that and make sure they know uh, each day what, what, you know, what tempo we're in. Um, most of our time on the field is used for players to self-correct. Um, I really believe that players learn by doing um, and they learn by self-correcting, right? So we love to have open-ended questions to not dictate as coaches as much when we're out on the field, but just let our kids um, learn by doing. Um, and with this whole idea as well is um, we want to make sure our players and our coaches are as prepared as possible on game day. And so that means, you know, mentally they got to be prepared, but also physically they have to be prepared. And so we don't want to wear our kids out during the week. Um, we want to make sure that we practice meaningful and get quality reps um, as opposed to lots and lots of reps that may not be that um, of high quality. And then on Friday nights, you know, we want our kids to be fresh. And so we're always going to sacrifice maybe a little bit of, you know, physical preparation so that our kids are on the field Friday night playing the game because that's what they sign up for. Um, and then for us as coaches, when we are on the field, we want to make sure we film everything. And so we look at practice time actually on the field as time that we're getting film of reps. And then one thing that we really spend a lot of time on defense doing is getting our, our second group of players, you know, our, our ones and our twos, similar amounts of reps. And so, um, you know, we get 60% of our reps are go to our ones and 40% of them go to our twos. And that's really all we have. We don't really have threes. Um, and so our twos get lots of reps. And I think that's helped us um, because football is obviously going to have some injuries, right? You got about, you know, we have 70 kids in our program and, you know, we get, we get kids hurt. I mean, just sports, right? And so um, having those kids prepared and ready to go uh, is super important. Um, this past season, we lost our best linebacker um, after week two. And, um, you know, a kid who had not been playing at all and did not plan on playing pretty much, but had gotten a lot of reps, 40% of them uh, had to start the following week and, um, you know, did a great job for us. And so I think that's important. Um, as far as our scheme, we want to make sure that we are really sound in teaching in the spring and summer. In fact, one thing that we do is uh, we want to make sure that going into week one, we don't have to get our game plan and, and change much from what we've done all, all summer. 
Um, we want the kids confident enough in what they've learned all summer that as soon as week one happens, like we're just ready to go. Um, in fact, anything that we're doing that we haven't done would be maybe a minor tweak that we are prepared and ready to go. Um, I think it's important to have a base plan that fits your players. You hear coaches talk about that a lot of, you know, I'm going to, if, if my defense, if I got a bunch of DNs um, and a bunch of more D linemen, then I'm going to run a four man front. And, you know, if I have more um, skill guys on the back end, I'm going to have, you know, a three, a five DB, three safety defense or whatever. That's all great. I, I believe in that as well of, of fitting your uh, plan to your players. But I also think you need to fit your plan to your staff. Your coaches need to be ready um, to have, have all the answers uh, in the defensive scheme that you're doing. So if you and your staff are not um, confident to have all the answers in a 4-2-5 because you've been running a 3-4 for several years, then I don't think you should do it. I mean, obviously, if you have the time to learn all those things and get confident, then go for it. But you shouldn't just change your um, scheme just because it fits your players best. It should fit your players and your staff best. I think there's a give and take there. Um, be able to have arrows in your quiver. I don't even know what that means, but a uh, old linebacker coach I had, uh, one of my old D coordinators used to say that all the time. And when he, what he meant by it was you've got to be prepared to take some calculated risks. You've got to have plan um, A, but also B, C, and D. And the only way that those plans B, C, and D can work in the games is if you've prepared them, um, prepared, prepared with and for them. And so um, do not be afraid to spend time having plan B, C, and D. And it's not going to be probably as good as plan A, but that's why it's plan B, C, and D. And so uh, he called it arrows in your quiver. Um, and uh, I think at the same time, uh, when you think about arrows in your quiver, put your players in the best spot to dominate on defense, right? So have some answers to what your kids do really well. And don't, you know, kind of going back to that, fitting your play, your scheme around your players, you know, you, you also have to be smart and put your scheme, uh, put your players in your scheme the right way, right? And so um, you know, we typically two gap on defense up, up front a lot. Well, if, if we don't have a lot of good two gappers, we need to have an answer in our game plan to be able to play um, a little bit different front. And so that should be in your overall game plan to be able to fit all the different types of kids that you may get. And then finally, um, instead of using the KISS principle, kill. Um, and um, I learned this from a guy named Ty Gower, keep it likable and learnable. Um, you know, look, you're going to face really good offenses. And in order to stop those offenses, you're going to have to have a plan. There's going to be some days where their guys are just better than yours. And the only way that you're going to have an edge there is by putting your kids in position um, to do something a little different. And uh, that's what he means by keep it like likable and learnable. Keep it fresh. Make sure that kids are having fun and there's new things, but make sure that you have figured out everything you can to teach that the right way so that they can do it the right way so that they're confident to do that different thing you're asking from them. And then finally in the game, I, I read uh, Finding the Winning Edge a long time ago from Bill Walsh. I still think it's probably the best football book of all time. And he used to say all the time, play the game week all week. Practice it like you're playing a game. You'll see that today. And then just stick with your plan. Um, and if you've properly prepared, then your plan is good and you can trust it. And, and use your coaches to keep that plan going, right? He was also big on the thing I said earlier of your players being ready for game night. You know, he always used to say his job as a coach is to have as many players ready on Sunday as possible. And mine's the same way. And so, um, you know, we need to have our kids ready on Friday night and you need to be prepared as a coach on fr for Friday night as well. All right. So what I want to do is just kind of go through what we do um, from Saturday uh, to Friday night. And uh, within that time, um, we're going to talk about how we scout an opponent. Uh, one thing that we do, I think that's different than a lot of people is we grade um, our opponent. Um, and that kind of builds our game plan. And so you're going to see some things that you would see on any defensive um, coordinators list of things to do during the week. Um, I, you know, defense is tons of time on the weekend. And as you get during the week, it's less time consuming. And I think offense is opposite of that. A lot more time on during the week, making adjustments, getting prepared, uh, and less time on the weekend. And so you're going to see a lot of stuff on Saturday and Sunday, and then it's going to go pretty quick during the week. And so here's what we'll normally do, right? So we have huddle assist. And uh, as we're waiting for huddle assist on Saturday morning, you know, we'll get up early and watch Friday night's game and just get a feel for the things that we uh, didn't see in Friday night with huddle sideline or in the game itself and just watch the game. Um, we will work on what we call chaos data, which is just a statistical data points um, where we look at, you know, things like tackle for loss and, and sacks and, and things that we did really well. And we have a number that we believe um, if you add all those statistics together, subtract 
um, the offense's big plays. You know, if, if, if your positives are 25% of your total plays, um, then, you know, it, our, um, our history tells us that we're going to, we're going to win the game because we're going to give up less than 17 points. So, so we have a thing that we, we look through and, and analyze that. And that usually just takes Saturday morning while we're waiting for huddle assist to finish. Uh, if we get done with that and, and huddle assist hasn't finished, then we start watching our opponent games, just what, watching them as um, not, not, not as a fan, but we just watch them through without doing anything, maybe taking notes on the side. Um, if huddle assist has gotten games back to us, then we will skip that step. We feel like the data is more important. Once we get the information from Huddle Assist, then we start doing our own data entry. Um, and the first thing that we'll do is we will cut up uh, all the formations that the team runs, and we include backfield set. So um, if you see, you know, trips right and the back is strong, that's different than when it's trips right and the back is weak. And so we go through that. Um, we, um, we, we create um, playlists uh, for our coaches. We do not share this with the kids yet, and they're just the formations. So we could get anywhere up from, you know, maybe we play some teams that only run five formations to teams that run 27 formations in the film that we have. Um, what we'll then do is we'll determine the most often used formations and we will start with those in our inputting of the data. And so we input our data, uh, not in the games, but we input our data through the formations. And so the data we use is obviously the 14 data points that um, Huddle Assist gives us, which is on the screen at the, at the beginning there. But we also use um, the data that we believe is important. It's seven other data points, play call, tag, backside route, route thrown, route complete, deep shot, and target. Obviously, we know what play call is. Tag is just any new thing on that concept or play. Maybe if they're a zone read team, it's, we call it a zone. But then we also have what they're doing uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the RPO part of it or maybe the read part of it. Backside route is exactly what it is. What routes are they running on the backside? Um, whether that's be trips or uh, two by two formation, the, pl the play call is, is the play side. And then we have, a, we could have a concept on the backside. So for instance, you could have like a, a sale concept, a post in a, in a 10 yard out here. Uh, and on the backside, if they're mirrored routes, you could also have a sale over there. Um, then uh, we, we do, we track the route thrown, the route complete, uh, deep shot, which is the offense attempting a pass of longer than 15 yards and uh, who's getting the ball, right? And so those things are important to us. And if you look on the screen, uh, you can see, um, you know, just that, that information there is, is what we, we think is important. Um, so then once we've got all that information um, on Saturday, we are going to start creating what we call hit charts. And these are just um, Google slides that are shared on our team drive, right? So we use um, uh, Google team drive, which we just have like a, a football 2020 or football 2019 folder that everything in the, about the program gets dumped in and all our coaches have access to it and we can all edit it and, and do different things to it. Um, and so what we'll do through, through those hit charts is uh, we will make every formation. So like I said, that could be anywhere from five to 27 different formations. And I'll show you a, 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 a hit chart here in a second. Um, and then from those hit charts, based on what the offense does, we find what we call formation groups. And so this is a little different than like personnel groups. Um, although personnel groups can be our formation groups, what we're looking for is commonalities between all the formations and like what teams offenses are doing. Because what we're trying to do and do is we're trying to pare down those 27 formations into no more than five formation groups for our kids to essentially memorize a game plan for those formation groups. So one of the formation groups might be, you know, open where they have, you know, 10 personnel, let's say, type of formations, you know, and anytime this group is in 10 personnel type formations, they do certain things. And so we want to defend those certain things. So it might be an alignment. It might be a blitz that we're doing. Um, we might have a certain call of like, hey, when they're in open and it's trips, we're doing this. When they're in open and it's twins, we're doing that. And so it's a way for our kids to kind of group down what the formation actually is. And so instead of a formation of all, oh, you know, backfield sets and, you know, is the, is the number three this far away and all that, we just put it into a group and we game plan to those groups. And typically what we've found is most teams have about four groups that we can plug everything into. And you'll see how we do that as well. Um, and then we start um, beginning the game plan sheet, right? And again, that's also shared on the team drive. And so just a couple examples of our, um, our hit charts. Um, the hit chart is just a Google slide. It, it could, it could be made on PowerPoint. 
Um, I'm sure there's all kinds of different things you could you, do. Uh, you could probably do this on Huddle um, Playbook on those installs um, as well. But uh, what we do is we use Google Slides and um, we name every single formation, including the backfield set. And like I said, if they were in gun split and then another time they were in, you know, um, offset gun where uh, maybe there was a sniffer to the right and the backs to the right, you know, that's a totally different formation to us. And we'll, we'll display how many times they run it in the top right. We'll display uh, how many, you know, what the different pass concepts that they ran and how many times they ran it in red. We'll display uh, how many outside ran, runs they ran to the strong side uh, out here. We'll sit, if there was a strong side inside runs, they'd be here. Uh, weak side inside runs and then weak side outside runs. And you'll see on different slides uh, how we do that. You know, how many times they ran, how many times they passed. Uh, if there are uh, any motions that would show up here in the top right underneath the plays. Uh, if there was teams that ran the exact same type of defense as us or if we've played them before, we'll put information about that down here. Um, and then up in the top left is the formation group. And so for this particular formation, it got bunched into what we called the two running back group, right? And so our kids would define what the formation was when the team broke the huddle or if there were no huddle on the line of scrimmage, what formation group they're in. So you'll hear, you'll, you know, you'll just hear a bunch of kids yelling two back, two back, two back. And that means something to us, right? So we're going to game plan for two back. Um, obviously, if you're playing teams that break the huddle really fast, like wing T, um, you know, you don't have time to do some of that stuff. And so you have to adjust a little bit of what your formation groupings uh, can be. And so what we do is we just try to fit things that our kids can identify when those huddles break. And some teams we play, the, they, they will, we will not worry about formation groupings to identify them to the kids as much because there's just not enough time. So here's an example of open, like I mentioned earlier, you see – um, you know, some motions and different things, uh, inside runs, weak and strong. Um, and again, several formations could be jumbled into the open formation group. And then sniff, which just stood for sniffer. Anytime this uh, number 20 was in a sniffer formation uh, or, or alignment, that, that meant something to us. And we did certain things uh, when they got into sniffer, whether it was here, here, whatever, however, it doesn't matter all these other guys, when he was a sniffer, that meant something. And so we game plan for that. And then finally, this particular team uh, also did a bunch. And they only did one formation out of this, but we thought it was um, important enough that we were going to call it a group because when they went bunch, that became a, a lot of perimeter screen screens for them. And we thought that was important. So we wanted to do some things for that. Okay, and so this is just kind of what our um, huddle uh, playlist looks like. Obviously, you see all these formations, and there was a few more than what's on the screen. But in red here were the formation groups. And this is actually what we're going to share with the players. All right. And so we're going to send out to the players these four formation groups. Um, and then obviously all the games, uh, whole games that we have of the opponent. Uh, but we are not going to share all these formations. We just think that clutters it up. And then we talk about these formation groups the rest of the, the week. All right. That kind of brings us to Sunday because that pretty much takes uh, all our time on Saturday. Again, we do not meet in person as a staff. Different uh, position coaches on defense have different responsibilities on Saturday. Uh, I do most of the work, um, but our other position coaches do have responsibilities that they have to take care of. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's a busy day. Saturday is a really busy day uh, for us in getting all that stuff done because that can take um, you know, it can take eight to 10 hours to get that information done on a Saturday. Um, and you know, I like to go to church on Sunday and, and be free for that. And so, um, you know, you could easily do less on Saturday and more on Sunday, uh, but that's just how I choose to do it. Um, on Sunday is where I think, you know, some of the real stuff starts to happen. And that is when we start grading our opponents. So we've already got the formation group. So we kind of know the offense. Now we want to look at the personnel. And so what we do, and I'm going to spend, uh, considerable amount of time here on grading and, and what we do is we grade the O-line in run and pass blocking and then we grade the quarterbacks and wide receivers in the quarterback timing of release and the wide receiver routes and timing of break. Um, we think that's super important and it gives us a lot of information. Also on Sunday um, we, we are an Atavis uh, program so we have partnered with Atavis to work on tackling and so um, we have a consultant who watches all of our games and, and reports to me on, on, um, on Sunday mornings uh, to talk about our tackle plan and what we're gonna discuss at our coaches meeting. Um, and then um, we start to um, create our alignments. We use our alignments on um, Huddle Playbook in the installs. Uh, and then we also um, create our scout team personnel uh, in those alignments. 
Um, so we'll get to that in a second. But first, what I want to do is talk about grading the O-line. Um, and so personnel grading for us is really what informs us of what our opponents do well. So we learn from the formation groups what they do. Um, and, and, and Huddle can tell us um, analytical data on, on what they're efficient at and things like that. But I think once you start to look at personnel, you see what the kids do well and how you can attack those kids. And so um, I think, to be honest, a lot of really good experienced defensive coaches can do this without grading. I think they can do it with a trained eye. But what we have figured out is a way to maybe um, speed up that untrained, that untrained eye. And so um, this grading will guide our game plans. Um, it's going to guide where we align specific D linemen. Um, it's going to align um, or it's going to um, define um, our movements. If, are we going to uh, slant and angle? Are we going to long stick certain players? Um, and it's also going to um, uh, guide our pressures. Um, the run game, it's going to guide more alignments and movements. The pass game and their protection is going to is going to guide our pressures. Uh, it's going to identify weaknesses and strengths of the offensive line. It's going to reveal difficult alignments or movements that the O line has to deal with, blitzes that the O line has to deal with, and then also going to reveal things maybe we should avoid because they're really good at those. And then finally, it's going to identify the wide receiver route timing and the quarterback release. Right, so it's going to reveal the time that um, a route breaks. You know what we use is when the wide receiver looks for the ball. And then it's going to reveal the time that the quarterback gets the rid of the ball. So maybe for us getting our hands up and things like that. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to grade the offensive line first. And I'm going to go through um, just a small sample of how we do that. Um, but what we do is we essentially grade each starter. And if there are any key backups, you know, uh, grading the offensive line is, is actually pretty simple because usually most teams just use five uh, linemen. But if you do see teams that rotate linemen, that obviously it's more work. Um, but you're not, you're not grading any more plays. There's only five linemen on the field, uh, typically. Um, and so uh, we grade each starter and key backup. We grade them in run blocking in three areas, and we grade them in pass blocking in three areas. And the three areas are the block that they're trying to make, right? So maybe it's a reach block, maybe it's a scoop block, maybe it's a down block, a double team, things like that. Um, we, we grade the alignment that they're blocking, right? So was it a blitz by a double zero linebacker? Um, you know, who's over the center, five yards off the ball and, and going to the A gap. Was it a, you know, a three technique um, and he was uh, slanting inside, um, you know, things like that. And then the execution, did the defensive player make the tackle uh, or did the O-line just actually miss, right? And so if the defensive player makes the tackle or the O-lineman just flat out misses, uh, we'll give um, the uh, offensive lineman a minus. And if none of those things happen, then we'll give them a plus. And so we're not necessarily grading technique, of the offensive linemen, offensive line coaches would grade uh, the offensive line that we're grading much harder than we are. We're grading it from a defensive standpoint, you know, and so are there things happening that, that created a tackle uh, and destruction on the, on the offensive, in the offensive backfield. And so if it did, then we want to give them a minus. So we're going to give them the benefit of doubt a lot. Pass blocking, gonna, again, the block. So it's usually slide or man um, uh, protection. Um, slide left, slide right, or just, you know, base block it if it's, if it's man. Um, the alignment again, just like we just talked about in run, and then the execution. Did the defensive player cause a quarterback to get out of rhythm, uh, or did the, again, then the offensive, offensive alignment just flat out miss, and we'll grade it plus or minus. And so here's a, take, this is a look at, at, at our grading sheet. Again, we just do this on Excel or Google Sheets. And you can kind of see we have our, our uh, opponent's line there, their numbers, what position they play, their height and weight, information about them a little bit. Um, and then we have the blocks, right? And so you can see the different blocks that they might see from down to zone double inside, things like that. Uh, the alignments that they're facing, uh, zero dash zero stands for zero, uh, double zero middle backer for us um, over the center. Uh, and then, you know, execution. And what this starts to do, um, we, we really just, um, we, we start going through the, uh, the most recent game. Um, if there's a game that is more important than the most recent game, you know, maybe because the team they're playing is, is more like us or runs a similar thing to us, then we'll look at that instead. But typically we go to the most recent game and we just start grading. And um, what we have found is that it basically takes about a half of football to figure out something. <laughs> you can figure out real quick what the weak link is of this offense you're playing. And it doesn't matter if your team that you're playing is really good or not very good, you're going to find at least one weak link. And it might be that that entire line is awesome, except for one guy got one minus one time. Well, 
that might be the thing you got to do. And so um, what you can kind of see on this um, sheet here is that there is a couple players that have a few more minuses in, um, in the run game, right? And it's the right guard and the center. And so we're going to focus really our, uh, in this particular video on the center um, because a um, little background on him. He was a sophomore. He was their weakest link. He's a good player. Uh, but this, the other four guys were studs. And so we felt like this was the one guy that we could maybe have an advantage over. And so what we figured out real quick is he struggled with one uh, shades and, and zero alignments, right? So one to us is just outside shade of the nose uh, of the center and zero is head up. And so um, we are 314. And so we were going to have that alignment no matter what. But what we decided to do was put our best defensive lineman who normally played end at nose this week because we thought that was the one spot that we could have an advantage. And then um, you also may notice the tight end um, on there. He only had to block a couple times um, and really not enough information to, to have us do anything special for him uh, in the run game. Um, but the only thing that we saw, like I said, was, you know, center alignment issues um, and then the center moving to his right or left issues, right? And so movement was going to be a big part of our game plan and then putting our best lineman at at nose and so i'm just going to show you a little bit how we would do this right so i'm not going to grade every single lineman but i am going to look at uh the center here right and so we would go through and we would mark down um you know the alignment that he's going to face and the block he's going to attempt right and so we we don't necessarily start what alignment he's facing now because we don't know who he's going to block yet okay and so as we roll this um we'll go through sorry i'll speed it up a little bit so as we, as we roll this, we'll go through and see, okay, all right, he's trying to make a down block on what looks to be a two, right? Maybe a two I, but we'll just go with the two and we'll grade him. So we put down block left, down left and two, right? And clearly his man's not anywhere near making the tackle. And so this, this guy gets a plus on the play, right? Uh, we can backtrack a little bit and look at someone else, right? Just to see how we would grade it. And you've got, uh, let's look at the right guard, one of the guy, another guy we thought was a little bit weaker. Um, you know, he's doing a kick pull, right? And he's trying to, to kick this guy, but he ends up, you know, logging him. Um, but he is clearly not successful at whatever he's doing because his guy actually makes the tackle. And so, you know, that guy's going to get a minus for that. And we're just going to put, you know, kick, pull, and we're going to put five because that's the alignment that that player was and we're going to give them a minus, right? And so we're just going to do that over and over through the different plays, right? And, um, you know, we can go back to our center again. Oh, and go back to our center again and look at, you know, him against another two looks to be. We'll see what he does here, right? Well, he's trying to zone double to the right, right? Zone double to the right on a two or a three, Right? And does, does a great job. He, he actually wins the battle, right? And so right off the bat, you wouldn't notice anything. It looks like this guy's doing fine on down blocks and doubles. But as we start to get into it more and more, you're going to start to see some things that will show up. So the first thing that shows up is he's facing a zero here, right? And he's trying to, what looks to be, um, he's trying to, what looks to be, um, you know, just down blocking. And his, his man doesn't make the tackle, so he would have gotten a plus on this. Um, but this is something that we might want to, you know, take notice of. Okay, this is the first sign that we looked at and thought, okay, first time he saw a nose, not too great. And so we, we continue to grade and look at things. And what you'll find, you know, over time is he doesn't do really well in space, right? So he's trying to block a double zero. His guy actually makes the tackle here, right? And he's not real good in space. He's really good at down blocks. He's really good at double teams. Um, and so, you know, we don't have control over what they're going to call as far as blocking scheme but we do have control of putting people in position that make it hard for him on some of the things that he's not good at. You can see something else that starts to show up with him is that he doesn't handle blitz as well, right? So when we did not have a, a zero nose, then maybe we would want to blitz an A-gap, right? And so that's starting to build into our game plan um, blitzing, right? Because they didn't do a good job of picking this up, right? And so you'll start to see some things show up with this center. Now, again, the trained eye would see this, but we are getting actual data to show an answer that we can actually do some of these things. Okay. So we'll go back to this, a zero nose, right? He's trying to perform a reach block. Not happening, right? 
clearly a minus on that, right? And so we would go through and continue to go through all these plays and we would end up with um, information that we have, that, that we shared earlier, right? And so you, you get these minuses that start to show up on movement things, right? When he's on a zero, a double zero, a one, when he has to move left or right and it's not a down block, he's not great. When he has to block someone in space and, and, or a blitzer, it's not great. And so we can, we can control that. Um, we can control how we align to that. And so we will start, we'll start to develop our game plan from that. And so one of the things um, that we decided to do, now this is us playing them, is again, we've got our zero nose. This is our best defensive lineman, and we put him at nose. Um, and we're going to you know, just have him play uh, our normal two-gap technique at times, and then other times we're going to move him. So on this clip, you're going to see things that, that happen pretty much all night, and that is a zone block that that player could not perform, and we get a sack out of it, right? And so when you watch from the end zone, right, there was an inability to – an inability to uh, reach block, right? So in this particular play, we would move, we, we put a, um, a two technique in, um, and again, not able to reach this guy, right? <clears throat> Another thing we did was we wanted to put movement, right? Because we saw that he didn't do well with movement. And so again, have our nose in there and we're gonna just slant the guy. Right. And although our nose doesn't make a tackle here, you can see he's, he's chasing the play from behind. Right. And so what we, you know, what we decided to do was, was do things that this center could not handle. Right. And so our grading is what is driving and guiding um, our scheme and our game plan uh, for that week. As you can see our center, I mean, our nose just doing a little bit of a slant technique and again, making, making havoc in the backfield. Okay. So we're also going to do this with uh, pass grading. All right, and you can see uh, this offensive line was, was really good at, at pass pro. And again, the really only slight little weakness was maybe that center. And so obviously this is also going to build into what we're going to do with our, with, our, um, with, our, with our game plan as, in that regard, right? So again, we're going to blitz, um, you know, a gap pressure. When we're not covering the nose, we're going to slant our nose. Uh, we're going to put our best lineman at nose. Um, and, and, and we feel like that would give us an advantage, right? And so we would go through. And we would grade the same way, right? We would go through and now we would just grade pass protection, right? And the plus and the minus that comes with that, right? And so we'll go through this a little bit quicker because I think you get the idea of what we're doing. Um, but here we, we're having a slide right. And, you know, at times you'll get in pass pro where the linemen don't do anything, right? They, they don't touch anybody. And so we would leave that blank. Okay? And so you can notice here uh, the first play slide right. He had a two alignment. He didn't even touch anybody. We just leave it blank. That's not giving us really inf any information, right? And then we'll continue to uh, grade these players just like we did in the run game. And what we'll find, again, is the place to attack is right up the middle, right? And so what we then develop as we go through these different clips is we develop a game plan that on passing downs, um, we want to do some things a little differently, okay? Um, and so we'll show one clip here on passing downs. You know, we want to make sure to put ourselves in position to perform blitzes maybe like this, where we get A-gap a -gap blitzes, because what we noticed was pressure happened, right? The other thing that you may notice is that number four had a couple snaps where when he was in the game pass pro, stuff like this happened where just, you know, no one, no one blocked anybody. And so, you know, we're starting to develop, not only do we want to put a nose over the center, we want to put our best player there. We want to slant our uh, nose uh, a little bit. When we don't have a nose in, we want to blitz the A-gap, right? And those are some things that we started to develop into our game plan, right? And it's all based off of this grading. And so, so then we'll go to the uh, wide receivers and the quarterback. Um, this is a little bit easier. This actually, um, I think, takes less time. Um, and what we do is we're going to uh, grade our quarterback um, in three areas as well. The drop that he's having. So a one step, a three step, a five step, if he's looking left, right, things like that. Um, the time it takes from the snap of the ball to him releasing the ball and then a plus or minus, um, you know, was the pass complete for wide receivers. We, we list the type of route, the time it takes from the snap of the ball to them breaking, and then was a completed pass to them. So on the wide receivers, a lot of times you'll get nothing because the ball wasn't even thrown to them. 
right? But we're trying to develop anything we can find in these players. And um, we'll, we'll go through pretty quickly how we do this. Um, you can see real quick, this is the quarterback. And again, same thing. It's about one half of football um, that we graded and we felt like we had an answer. And what we discovered with this player is obviously he gets rid of the ball really quickly. Um, and so we discovered, you know what, we're probably not going to be able to just blitz him the normally normal way we blitz off the edge. Um, we're going to have to do a couple things. We're going to get up the middle pressure, which kind of falls in line with what we saw with the center. We can blitz the A gap. We're going to have to, if we do blitz the edge, uh, train our kids on the time it's going to take for them to get their hands up, right? So instead of just saying, hey, this guy gets rid of the ball quick, get your hands up, we actually give them a time. And so what we discovered in this is we said, hey, at 1.5 seconds, you need to get your hands up, right? So we have to train to our kids how long is 1.5 seconds if they have a free rush at the quarterback, right? Because what we found is if you have a free rush from the edge of the quarterback, it's going to take about 1.8. So you're not going to make the sack. So those kids learned real quick about how close they were getting to that player. And you'll see, even on the film, our kids jumping a lot. And it actually got us in trouble a little bit, but they were cognizant of, you know, I got to get my hands up. The other thing that we decided with this quarterback was the only way we were going to get him to hold the ball longer was to make him think that he could get rid of the ball quick because we were bringing pressure and then actually sim pressure and drop out and make him maybe clutch the ball, hold the ball a little second longer, and then maybe we could get home in a two-second uh, free, free rain blitz. And so you're going to see sim pressures. Uh, the wide receiver timing, uh, all we're looking for is trends, trends. And the only thing we found with this particular team was number 20. Number 20 starts to develop a trend. Um, if we had more data, we had actually with number 20, we had to go back and look at several games and more than just a half to, to confirm this trend. But what we discovered from all our other sheets is that number 20 um, on a vertical route, um, he declared that vertical route within 1.6 seconds every time. In other words, every um, out or hitch or any side to side breaking route that he ran the break always happened at 1.6 or less. In fact, it almost always happened at 1.5. There was a few outliers of 1.6. And so what we trained our kids, uh, specifically our safeties, who were going to be covering this tight end uh, in past concepts, was um, we had to time up what 1.5 seconds meant to them. And it happened to be three uh, soft pedals for our safety. And so our safeties knew that after three soft pedals, if he had not done an in or out break, that he was running a vertical route. And it just helped our kids to know what they were going to be prepared for. And so that's going to not only guide our game plan, it's going to guide what we tell our kids, right? And so what we would do is we would time the time the ball leaves the center's hand, right? So around when you see it show up behind his butt, so maybe somewhere around there, down on huddle, it says 6.69. And then we're just going to time the release of when he gets rid of the ball. So the ball's out of his hand right now at 7.78, right? So again, that's about a 1.1, super quick. Obviously, this is a little bubble screen, um, but super quick, right? And so we'll go through and we'll time all those, all those routes with our, with our um, quarterback that we're, that we're grading, okay? And we'll do the same thing on the next play, right? So we'll go through slow and that ball snap there, you know, 4.9, we'll say, okay, by the time he throws it. Now there's a little fake there, so this is a little bit longer, right? 6.71. All right, so that's more along the 1.8 time, but it was with the flash fake, right? And again, what do you see happen, right? The team that, we're, that they're playing, getting their hands up, right? And so we're starting to see some things for our kids to look at and say like, oh, you know what? We can, at 1.5 seconds, we need to do something, right? And so as long as we time up what that is in practice, 1.5, our kids can learn. It's maybe this amount of steps or it's this, um, this distance away from the quarterback. This is what I should do. All right, at the same time, we're gonna time routes, okay? So let's look at number 20 here, since that's the guy we were looking at anyway. And the ball is snapped right about now, okay, 4.98, let's say 4.9. When is he going to break, right? And so we're going to look, and when he looks for the ball right now, that's when we're logging the time, right? So it's 6.4, which is exactly 1.5, like we said. Um, and we, what we found, like I said, is that trend shows up over and over again. And so what then we're going to develop as we go through all these clips and you see same types of stuff, really quick releases, getting the ball out quick. If they are not bubble screens and tunnel screens, you're going to see number 20 breaking after 1.5. There he is again, right? You're going to see this timing start to develop. And so we want to defend that timing, right? And so those numbers, like we already showed, are what we get. And we're going to focus on his timing. And the only receiver that we're going to focus on is giving us information 
was number 20. And we think that's important, even though there's only one out of the five receivers that we have listed that gave us a tell, we're going to use that. All right. It's going to build our game plan. And so this is just a snapshot of our game plan. Um, and so this right here was a seven man pressure where we're bringing all kinds of people. But along with that, we had uh, this right here, which was our simulated pressure to this seven man pressure, right? And this simulated pressure was only bringing four. And so that's something that we're going to do against that quarterback. At the same time, when we're playing catch man with our DBs, they know when the guy breaks at within 1.5, like it's, that's it, we're going. And if he doesn't, it's a vertical on number 20. Um, we also implemented our, what we had called Mocha, which was just our double A gap pressure, right? We had another, another double A gap pressure here. Um, and, you know, so we start to develop things that fit the grading. Okay, so here's, here's Mocha, one of the things we did um, based off that. And you'll see it, right? So as you're watching the clip here, uh, this is what looks to be our seven-man pressure. Uh, they do an audible, and so then we're going to check out into our mocha. And what it's going to do is allow us to get a TFL on a speed option that probably should have busted for a touchdown. But because we can beat the front uh, because of our deception and, and our game planning against the center, you know, that, that helps. Okay, um, Mocha again, what we decided to do, again, was that double A gap pressure, forcing pressure, and we get a defensive lineman interception, which is always fun. But these are all things that we developed because of the timing and the grading that we saw on scout film. Okay, uh, here is our sim pressure which is a seven man uh, look, but then only a four man rush. And the idea was to try to get this guy home right here. Right? And you're gonna see uh, that happen quite a bit. And you're actually gonna see our kids, um, you know, trying to jump and, and knock the ball down at a certain time, right? And so uh, this is a screen that, you know, they got some yards, but it was third and long and they don't convert. And you'll see here again, uh, just a simulated pressure. We're trying to get this guy free here. He does get free. He doesn't make the tackle, but he definitely puts pressure on. And again, this guy just holds the ball for just enough time to, uh, you know, let us allow that, allow us to get that home, right? And so you'll see, he wants to throw the ball. He thinks he's getting seven man pressure, which is what sim pressures are designed to do. But, you know, he's going to double clutch. Usually we, you know, like we said, 1.5, that ball's coming out. He has a guy open. He wants to throw here. But because of the, the uh, deception, it, you know, it didn't work. And so he holds on to the ball. This is a clean shot. Our kid just misses. We get the sack anyway. But, you know, what we did was we, by knowing who this kid really was, we were able to mess with him a little bit. Okay? So that's how we grade. Now, that's all Sunday. Okay? And then we're going to go through on Sunday and we're going to develop – um, how we're going to align to everything. And we use Huddle Playbook installs to do that. And so it just looks like this. And we would go through, you know, every uh, formation grouping and we'd go through multiple formations in there and show the kids on Sunday night. We'd send it to them in a uh, presentation on Huddle that they can look at and see how that we're going to align to everything. And that thing might have 20 some clips in there um, because of all the formations they run, but they'll notice real quick the kids and it'll, we'll, we'll tell them, hey, this is in all the, you know, two back or the sniffer. Uh, groups. This is how you're going to align most to these to these to these uh, groups, and then we'll show them the different formations, how they continually align with the same rules. And then this is what we do on our scout team. At the end of that, we'll have our scout team, and we we really spend a lot of time with our scout team, matching it up uh, personnel to fit what we're playing, and really put a ton of pressure on these kids who don't necessarily play a lot in the games usually, um, ex outside of our offensive line. Um, these kids, you know, like in this week, this kid had a big role. And so did the, 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 these two kids, right? And so, you know, we really want to push on these kids that are important. And, and if we have a good defensive plan and, and execute it on Friday night, a lot of it has to do with how well these guys played on the scout team. And we really pump those guys up um, all week and, and tell them how important they are. And I think that does something for our kids to know that we're all in this together. It's a team sport. Uh, even though some kids don't get to play as much on Friday, um, you know, we want to make sure everybody on our team knows that, you know, 
number, you know, Trey's job is really important this week. In fact, if we win Friday, it's because Trey did his job Monday through Thursday. And so then uh, after uh, Sunday morning is up, we meet as a staff. We meet with Atavis uh, in a conference call to go through what we're actually going to uh, implement tackling. Uh, and then our staff meets and we, we ask three questions, uh, five questions, and it takes about two and a half hours. Um, we covered the JV install, the varsity install, and, you know, what and who do we need to stop? How do we stop it or him? Um, what, who can we take advantage of with alignment personnel and pressure? That comes from our grading. This comes from our grading. And then how we align to form, how are we, how do we align to formations, right? That'll also come from our gradings. When do they become a passing team? We think that's super important because that's when you can get into all your fun third down stuff, right? When do teams become a passing team? Most teams it's third and seven, but you'll find sometimes it's third and five. It might be second and six. And so you can do a lot more sim pressures and things to those types of teams. If it's a wing T team and, and you know, they, their passing is, you know, at a different time. I mean, every team becomes a passing team at some point and that's when your fun stuff can happen. You don't want to spend tons of time on that, but that is a portion of the game. Um, and then also at the end, we just figure out what we're going to have on the call sheet. We finish our game plan and we finish practice schedules and then we finish all the huddle playbook alignments so we can send it out to the kids. Here's what our game plan looks like. It's really simple. It's one page. It's in that uh, presentation sent to the kids. I, I don't like paper packets and all that stuff. They just throw it away anyway. Um, here's our groups. You can see there's some rules in our groups. Certain groups mean base. That's all we're doing. Other groups mean some certain things and our kids are going to memorize those. Then we have by position what they need to know and what their rules are. On Monday when we meet, we'll talk about those, right? We go through each position. And then at the end, we also have our scout team again, just as a reminder. Okay, our practice schedule during the week um, is, this is just defensive minutes, defensive time. So we have 35 minutes of player meetings, 25 minutes on the field. Uh, 10 of that is tackling here, uh, 45 minutes on Tuesday and 45 uh, in meetings and 45 minutes on the field. That's a really long day for us. Uh, Wednesdays, 15 minutes in meetings and 40 minutes on the field. And then Thursdays, we have no meetings and 20 minutes on the field. And overall, defense and offense special teams, our kids um, are in 11 hours of meetings and practice a week. Okay, so on Monday for a staff, we're going to create our cut ups for our lunch meeting, which is just our game from Friday. Uh, typically, it's tackling information. Um, and then uh, we watch that at lunch with the kids because tackling is the only thing that really is going to co coincide with the next week. You know, you might be playing a wing tee, you might be playing a double wing, you might be playing an option, you might be playing spread. Um, a lot of the things that you did schematically in your last game are not going to apply to the next. And so we look at tackling as the one thing that never changes. And so that's what we really focus on. Uh, once that lunch meeting's over, we're done with the last game with the kids. And now we're going to look at the next, the next opponent. And so we'll create cut-ups for that. Um, and show them what we think we, they need to see. Typically, it's out of those groupings, uh, formation groupings, um, and we will get the practice plan and the play cards all ready. We do pods and inside run and two-on-two -on, -two on Monday. It's a very um, – uh, there's hardly any team on Monday for us, right? We're still kind of mentally putting the game plan into the kids' heads, um, and, uh, and, and, and we'll install it, right? And like I said, the players are going to read the game plan, they're going to discuss amongst the position groups. So the D linemen will look at the game plan and talk as a group what they need to get done, what they don't understand on my game plan. Um, we'll allow them to look at it for about a minute. If they have questions, we'll go over it, uh, and then we move on. This is a shot of our practice schedule, you know, everything up in front. But then defensive team um, is not really team at all. It's inside run and, and three on three, which is a, a perimeter drill for our DBs. Um, and depending on the offense that we're playing that week, the, the types of kids, you know, the positions here might be different, but that's usually what we do. We either spend time doing a pod, which is, which for us would be maybe half line or interior line only. Um, we do an inside run maybe, uh, or we would do maybe a blitz on barrels if we're playing maybe a spread team that we're going to blitz a lot or something. We go right into our blocking and tackling stations and that's the end of practice. All right. When we get home, we look at our, at our, uh, at our practice film, right? So if we blitz drilled, if we uh, three on three, if we two on two, if we inside ran pod, we film everything, right? And so we'll go through and, and uh, grade that. Uh, and when I say grade, just make corrections and we send a playlist to the kids. That's about 10 clips uh, from practice, the things that we need to fix for the next day. Okay. We then start to create our, t our Tuesday scout cards. And on Tuesday, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to do inside run, 
do all our run stunts as a team, uh, an inside run, uh, maybe some in team. We're going to spend our focus on run downs, right? So first and 10, second and four to seven, the normal down stuff, and then all their most often run formations and, and plays. And we'll be working on the call sheet throughout. When we get to Tuesday morning, like we said, our Tuesday uh, uh, afternoon, we get that long player meeting. Which we have a class on campus. Um, they lift weights on Monday, Wednesdays, and we can meet on Tuesdays, and they have academic time Thursdays and Fridays. And so we have a long player meeting to discuss defense only for 35 minutes. We go over all the normal down calls we're going to do that day, and we teach them the answers that our staff came up to with our big five questions about the opponent. And then we have our longest practice of the week. And so basically everything that you could think of in a normal practice that's in there, um, except for seven on seven because we're doing all the normal down stuff and we film everything. So that's kind of a look at practice there. You know, a lot more time spent on practice and defense. All right. Tuesday night, we do the same stuff as far as uh, correcting the film, making sure our notes are positive. We like to use uh, we and us instead of you words, uh, making sure that if we're focusing on one D lineman making a, uh, we got a fix, we say, you know, we need to do this. Um, and we try to make sure it's a team thing instead of picking on one kid. We want to make sure our kids don't feel picked on, that they're always getting coached um, and, uh, and everybody's getting coached. And so if one kid's getting coached, they're all getting coached. We kind of build on that. And we, and we build our playlist for the next day and to send to the kids as things we need to fix for today. And that's kind of how we word it. All right. And then we start to work on our scout, team, scout cards for Wednesday, which is third down stuff, short yardage and a lot of the blitz stuff. And so we'll start to show blitz cutups to the kids at that point. Okay, we have a short meeting on Wednesday where we just kind of go over the blitz cutups and the things to fix um, that maybe were issues and questions. Um, we'll do some blitz review. We do all of our blitzes in seven on seven for the most part. We rarely blitz in team, our, our pass pressures. Um, do all our third down calls in seven on seven. We'll do some of our short yardage and normal down fixits that we needed to do in team. And we film everything, right? Wednesday night, sorry, there's our practice, right? And then Wednesday night, we're going to do the same things that we've been doing, but now we're going to grade those pat, those uh, more of those third down calls and inside uh, uh, short yardage calls. Um, we did on Thursday night, uh, Wednesday night, create our scout cards for Thursday that are just going to be the most popular things and the stuff that we really haven't had trouble with during the week. And hopefully on Wednesday night, we finish the call sheet. And so what we're trying to do on Thursday is again, uh, recreate the things that we need to really finalize for the game. Okay. We have no meeting Thursday practice is heavy special teams. Defense is, is, you know, walk through mentality, but run through pace. It's fast pace. We want to feel what a game is like without getting physical a super quick whistle. I want to keep my kids fresh. Uh, if a kid gets hurt on Thursday, that's the head coach's fault. Um, and, and the scout offense is going to run things that we struggled with. And the main things, if we have any blitz, the formation stuff, we'll probably practice that. If we're filming anything on Thursday, we're probably in trouble. And so I don't film things on Thursday. Uh, and then on Thursday night, we'll start to implement the next opponent and starting to do the huddle stuff on the next opponent if we have it. Um, it's also important, I think, on Thursday to sleep, right? And so I just heard um, – I was actually listening to a, a podcast called uh, um, the Freakonomics Radio, and um, they did a special on the 49ers. And um, – Kyle Shanahan kind of mentioned how he pretty much doesn't sleep. And um, I, I don't know if that's healthy. He mentioned basically that the coaches don't need to be fresh because they're not playing the game. And, you know, I think mentally we have to be so fresh. And so I think, you know, I try to shoot for nine hours of sleep on Thursday and I never get that during the week, but I try to shoot for nine hours of sleep so I can just be, you know, ready to go on Friday. All right. And there's Thursday's practice uh, plan. As you can see, it's pretty quick and we're out of there usually way before five. All right. And then so Friday shows up and you've got your last minute touches on the call sheet. Um, and what I like to do and this, I started doing this a couple years ago is I pick one game that we scouted and just watch the game. And I pretend with my call sheet, I call the game, right? I put myself in the game. And so just pick one of their games. It doesn't really matter. And just get used to calling the game. Right. And you're, you're watching, you know, huddle film calling the game. Um, I try to make sure that all that stuff's done by lunch so that from lunch on um, I am there for the kids and we're not worried about any more, you know, printing things or anything like that. We can just relax. Um, we review with the players right after our team meal, you know, how we're going to call things, all reminders, nothing new, going over adjustments or plan B's and C's, things that we've told them about from Monday, since Monday. Um, and then go play the game, right? And use whatever technology you have 
uh, to fix issues in the game and confirm your game plan. And I think the Bill Walsh principle applies. Stick with the game plan, trust your gut, but run what was practiced all week, right? And remember this, that you're, if you've prepared really well, your game plan is good, and so run it. Because preparation and your personnel is always going to trump play calling. If you, can, if you can work really hard, like I said, and from the beginning, the defensive guys work hard on Saturday and Sunday, and the rest of the week gets fast. And so if you can work really hard Saturday and Sunday, trust that preparation because the things that you saw Saturday and Sunday when you were focused, relaxed, and there was no pressure, those are probably the real things you saw. And if you put in the work, things on Friday night are going to be things that you saw. Now, obviously, you got to trust your gut sometimes, but the things that you saw during the week are the things that are happening Friday night. And so don't let the pressure of the game uh, dictate what you're going to do. Let your game plan and all your preparation during the week dictate your game. And uh, I think you'll be happy with the results. So appreciate uh, everything that uh, uh, been able to share with you guys today. Um, it's been a blast. I love sharing uh, information. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I will undo my screen share here. Coach, that was a great job with the defensive game planning. I have a couple questions for you. Can't let you escape with that. Um, so when you guys break down your, your huddle film, are there different coaches responsible for different fields? And yeah, how do you so, that down? yep. So, um, how we work it is, um, the nuts and bolts I go through, um, play call is what I go through. Um, well, let me backtrack. Huddle assist does all the normal stuff. Sure. But then I do play call tag, uh, backside concepts. My DB coach does, um, route thrown route completed uh, deep shot and target mm -hmm. my d line coach grades the um the, the uh, pass game and my linebacker my inside linebacker coach grades uh the run game and then i grade the quarterbacks and wide receivers gotcha okay yeah so we divvy it out yeah because i was gonna say if you do that all by yourself that that's way more than like eight to ten hours for uh yeah, well, so the 8 to 10, the 8 to 10 is not including the grading. The grading would then be, um, the grading takes about an hour. I mean, it takes about a half of a game, right? So I can, I can get them done now. Like, I'm pretty fast at it. But 35 minutes, I'd say, for um, the receivers and quarterbacks. Um, my D-line and linebackers takes them about an hour to do the, a half of the, um, of the offensive line guys. So, so, yeah, you start adding that, and that's another two to three hours. Um, that you would have to add on to, to that eight to 10, eight to 10 for me is just Saturday getting everything ready for Sunday. Now that sheet with the grades, was that a template that you just had to create by yourself or is that something that was like kind of passed down to you? Yeah, it is something I created, but uh, it's, it's kind of both. The answer to that question is both. So um, if I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Dub Maddox uh, who does R4 football systems, um, right. our often our offensive guys have been R4 football systems from the beginning. And um, they do that grading. In fact, Dub has recently done a, a Zoom on how he does his grading for offense. And so our guys have been doing that on the offensive side of the ball for four years now, maybe. And after year one, I was like, there's got to be a way defensively to do this. And so we just started kind of developing our defensive plan. And I, I think it's still, you know, it's, we've only done it two years. And so I think it's still an in infancy. I think there's more things to do. The more I share with other coaches, the more they have even ideas that I didn't think about. So um, yeah, so we kind of stole it from, from uh, R4, uh, but then modified it for defense. I mean, you always got to take what those offensive guys are doing and modify it to make yeah, cause, it Because those guys cheaters. are always, like, trying to get ahead of us anyways, right? Well, I mean, they're smarter than us. And so, <laughs> you know, the offensive guys are smarter. So we got to catch up. Yeah. Okay. So I have a uh, question about Mocha. When you guys are running Mocha – and let's say like the back flares, do you guys peel with it or you guys just send them anyway? Yeah. So actually in that one clip where the D lineman got the interception. So how we teach Mocha. So, so Mocha is kind of funny because Mocha is just um, Saban terms for Maka, Makasin. Mm -hmm. And um, one of our coaches who, who kind of brought it to our attention thought it was pronounced Mocha. So we just called it M-O-C-H-A Mocha. Um, and what Mocha is, is it's a, not a blitz peel. It's a, um, everybody has the running back. That's how you, that's how we teach it. So okay. if you're a blitzer outside of the a gap blitzers, you have back if you see them. So, so there's four D linemen, essentially two DNs and a, 
in a uh, in a in two interior guys one of those guys is going to have the sniffer so mocha to us is a sniffer only it's an 11 personnel blitz we wouldn't run it against a 10 personnel um, so one of our ends is going to have the, the sniffer man to man and we use what we call a choke technique so he's getting his hands all over him holding the crap out of him if he runs a route he's got a man to man um, and then that leaves the two inside a gap blitzers um, who I tell them, you know what, you don't have the back. Let's hit the quarterback. Because if you get there and the back peels, let's hit the quarterback. Then you've got three D linemen who, if they sense back, so screen, flare, they go with it. And then you have a safety blitzing on the edge who would be um, a, a, a blitz peel. Mm -hmm. Then you have a, a nickel or somebody on the other edge who would be a blitz peel. So you basically have, you know, you're, you're sending on Mocha, you're sending like seven guys. Right. Um, and really only two of them are not picking up the back, right? Now, if they don't see it, they don't see it. But in that particular play, that D lineman saw the back running a screen, so he just dropped hmm. and they went right to him. And so that's how we teach it. And so um, it's a pretty complicated blitz. Um, it is the, it's really one of the only things we'll do against sniffer 11 personnel formations. And so our kids are pretty good at it because we do it a lot. Um, you can do a bunch of things with it. Um, we do some different tags where we, um, the, the safety that's blitzing, we spy him instead. So he has the back all by himself. And then, then all the, everyone's uh, then, then everybody's going, you know, yeah. or you have spy on the quarterback. Um, and then you still keep your, your, uh, your, uh, everybody has the back rules in place. So that's how we run Mocha. Okay. And then when you guys are doing your sim pressures, like, um, what are the back four doing? Are they still so, so Are you guys like playing quarters or palms behind yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, so we, we, play, we play quarters in our base um, coverage. So we'll play palms, quarters. Um, that's pretty much what we do over and over again. Um, and um, we will uh, we'll show so, – so anytime we run our um, – so we, we basically have three um, seven- or six-man line fronts that we'll do on third down. And then we have three sim pressures off of those. And so there are three different looks. Um, and then, and then um, when we run our seven or six man pressure, we play man and we play catch man. And so everybody's seven yards off the ball or at the sticks kind of depends on that. And uh, they're breaking, you know, they're not gonna have time. We're going to have a free rusher. We're always gonna have a free rusher. So we tell our kids, you, you know, we, we're playing catch man on, on, on breaks, you're jumping. And so really the only thing they can get us on is a straight fade that somehow they made a quick move and our kid jumped, you know, and mm -hmm. the guy's still going to have a guy free rusher in his face. Um, so when we, when we send pressure off that, we want to make it look like that. And so our kids are all at seven, but they might be playing palms or they might be playing quarters. We typically play press and everything unless we're on third down bringing every, everybody. And so there is a different look there that they have to look. The quarterbacks can tell, you know, oh, they're in. You know, the quarterbacks know we're either bringing them all or not. That's all they know, you know. And so um, – but we will be playing quarters, palms – but they, we do it from that seven yard off alignment. That's okay. tough. It's, it's difficult to teach. We, we spend a lot right. of time teaching that. Yeah. I know I was having problems uh, teaching my, my guys just to play at the sticks because we do something uh, pretty close to the same thing that you were talking about. But it's like, guys, play the stick and then break on it. They got to get rid of the ball like super fast if you're bringing seven, you know? Yeah. And kids get, they get nervous, you know, and they, they don't yeah. want to get beat deep, but they have to understand. Like, I think the first time a kid gets beat deep, you know, we can't yell at them we got to go yell at the front that didn't make it home so that our, so that our kids on the back end are confident that, you know, that they're not scared to make a mistake, that they're aggressive. You know, we also have to teach how to, how to really engage and play proper catch, you know, and to stack that route and, and to really just, you know, engage with the guy to crash him. Um, and to, you know, one, we've gone back and forth. We've, we've slow pedaled, we've uh, buzzed. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we scooch, you know, which is just that inside foot, you know, uh, kind of step replace thing. And that, that to us has been the best, the scooch. And so, it keeps our kids, they feel like they're able to get some depth, but they're really not, they're not moving uh -huh. at all. And, and they can still stay square. So that, that's what we've kind of gone on. And, you know, once you hit a home run sack or once they break on a hitch and make a play um, or once they get beat deep because of a double move, but we get a sack, they, they get the confidence, you know, and you'll see, I mean, even on that, um, that one where our, our edge rusher missed the sack and then we end up getting a sack anyway, there's a dude running for a fade for a touchdown, right? So once they start to trust, like, hey, I just got to do what I'm told, and, and, and if everything works together, we'll get, we'll get the sack, even if my job maybe 
I would have got beat if I didn't have my 10 other buddies doing their job. You know, I think that's part of the, part of the thing with blitzing, you know, and they got to know it's a risk. Like we're going to get beat sometimes. Yeah, definitely. All right, coach. Um, I'm going to sign us off. Do you have anything else you would like to add before we end? No, I just appreciate doing it. Like I said, I love sharing and um, learning. And I think, uh, you know, we can always learn from other, other guys. And I think each time that uh, we speak, um, you know, we, we practice teaching to our kids. So I, I'd really just encourage more guys to get out there, especially in this time. Don't be afraid, get out there, share what you know. Um, you know, if, if you've learned it, it's probably pretty good. And so share it because it's going to help you be a better teacher in the long run. So thanks. Thank you, coach. Appreciate it. Hey coaches, please like, and subscribe so you can stay up to date on our most recent videos for our YouTube channel. Also make sure you check out our online clinic at clinic.chiefpigskin.com. Thank you guys. Appreciate you.